in the first 5,000 days, we've had a lot of progress with the web. Uh, the first part of the web was about connecting to the web. Remember? Do you remember? How many of you remember people talking about the web at the office, kind of like it was a drug? It's like I gotta get, I got, I gotta get off that thing. I, I, I was, I went in there, and the next thing I know is somewhere else, and I miss my TV show. <laughs> I, I miss my. T and next thing is three in the morning. I'm like, God, I gotta go to bed. I gotta get up for work in the morning, you know? Um, and, and and it just, and then you hear that, so it's like, well, I better go check that web thing out. You know, it's this informal sneaker net is saying the thing's pretty cool. Uh, but it was all about connecting too, and what Mark Andreessen brought with uh, with Netscape, uh, Mosaic, its predecessor, was a standard way to access. So you're connecting to the web. You can connect to it to see your bank accounts. Back then, we were all looking at our portfolio, saying, "Should I retire at 35 or 36?" I don't know. Um, but you could access your information, right? And then, because more and more information went up there, we needed to organize the information. So Yahoo came along with the search, and then obviously Google came along with PageRank and took that over. And then someone said, well, hell, you can make money on this stuff. So Bezos comes along, creates Amazon, right? And those are kind of the big animals of the two value propositions of Web 1.0, access and find. That's what we were doing. But we were connecting to the web, you see what I'm saying, through the browser to pull stuff down. Then a 19-year-old kid named Sean Fanning comes along, and he doesn't think about the web that way. He thinks about the web as connecting through the web. So this is now an environment where we connect. And he came up with peer-to-peer -peer music. Uh, Napster was the, was the technology, which basically, anyone in the recording industry? Cut, cut the knees off, right? I mean, fundamentally changed the business model. It's like you normally go buy a CD, now you can get it for free, and it's going viral through, through the networks. We have a business model problem. Uh, then you get eBay. Anyone here an eBayer? Okay, do you work for eBay? No, eBay works for you. It's a whole economic platform that turns your trash into treasure, right? That's what it is. There are these new economic platforms that are emerging as a result of this technology. Uh, 700,000 people generate their primary or secondary revenue in the United States from eBay. Over a trillion transactions a year done through eBay. It's a new economic platform for entrepreneurial capitalism. MySpace? eighth largest country in the world. Facebook just took over, so Facebook's now, I guess, the seventh largest country in the world. This is participative. The first web was about democratization of access. Web 2.0 is about the democratization of participation. And that's what these kids do. The web is an appliance to connect. That's all it is. And they're not scared of it. It's not like, ooh, you know, I don't want to touch that thing. And by the way, people like my mom are jumping on in droves, because they, they're at a distance and they want to connect. And if this is what the kids do, this is what I'll do. The one thing that they both have that we don't, time. So it's a fallacy. It's a fallacy that older people don't get onto this. Just look at the statistics. It's bimodal. Okay? YouTube, we know the story on that. The interesting thing is all the people who run all this stuff, it's the same mob running around and around and around. So the YouTube guys came from PayPal. And the PayPal guys came from Netscape. So they, they all have this understanding of what the network is, and they're just playing it through into different business models, coming out with good valuations, and doing it over again. Mark Andreessen's, if any of you use Ning, that's his new thing. Uh, he, his company before that was Loud Cloud. He was too early. That was all about cloud computing, and you know the guy's just smart. He, he, he sometimes if you're too smart technologically, you miss the market because the market, you know, there's a late, there may not the latent need hasn't surfaced yet. So he missed the ball on on, on that. Now we're getting into 3D internet. This is where I'm spending most of my time at this time. Carl and I are spending a lot of time looking at this. How many of you uh, uh, have heard of either Second Life or World of Warcraft or? Okay, how about uh, Webkins or Penguins or any of these? Yeah, Webkins, right. So, so basically, you know, my kids, my wife and I have had the discussion, and they, they get two avatars. They can have two other identities other than their own, you know, and so one kid's got two penguins, or one penguin and one Webkin, and the other one we're still working on. Um, he, he's only got one so far. He's got a Webkin with his brother. You get up into the teens, you're probably managing seven, eight, nine, ten different identities. And even within one game, you might have different alts, depending on alt is an alternate identity, depending on how you feel. I was just at MIT recently, and, and one of the things that people worry about with these 3D worlds is their economies in and of themselves. So, so there's a lot of money laundering and stuff going through. And the issue of identity is very high, because it's hard to track identity inside these environments. Um, we were at MIT, and we had a very interesting uh, thought experiment where we said, OK, imagine a room where in one, in one room, the, virtual, the avatars, the virtual uh, People know what avatars are? OK. They all look the same, and you can't tell their sex. So the voice has been, but everybody who needs to make the decision is there. And in the other one, everybody is photorealistic, and you know who they are, and you know their position in the company. 
which team makes the best decision? Research isn't out yet, but go to MIT's site. Judith Donath is the one looking at it. It's going to be very interesting. Very interesting to understand. When, when we were launching Second Life inside of IBM many, you know, four years ago, uh, it didn't have, it didn't have uh, chat. You could, I mean, you couldn't speak in there. It didn't have voice, voice over RP, but it had chat. So you had a 3D environment where you could chat. Our colleagues in Asia were incredibly chatty. The minute voice took over, they receded into the background because they didn't want to talk. So there's a whole new medium. Digital rich 3D interactive sans voice is a very good way to collaborate with folks in the East. All kinds of new medium coming out.